Awesome. Thanks for tuning in on Facebook Live and YouTube for Investment Insight today, guys. Thanks for coming in. Um, a little correction. One of the things I said in last Investment Insight was incorrect was there was a bill that changed the 1099 reporting from $600 to $1,000, but we did confirm it's still at $600. So if you pay anybody over $600, you are required to 1099 them. That was a correction from last meeting. I thought that bill had passed, but it did not. Obviously, Investment Insights, Education Space, Dairy Best for Action Information. Please seek out competent legal and tax and uh, accounting advice for any situation before you make any decisions. There's our disclaimer. So cool. Um, got a couple fun facts today, kind of more than normal. Um, one of my favorite ones is, how many millionaires do you know have become wealthy by investing in savings accounts? You know, and I, I think it's really important because if you think about what, what we see right now with interest rates, and you're starting to see some of these money market accounts kind of drop. You know, Goldman Sachs announced they were cutting their money market rate a little bit. Whatever the rate of inflation is, tends to be what the CD rate is. If inflation is 4 or 5%, that's what a CD is going to pay. And then you got to pay taxes on it, right? Because one, one of the things that's been affecting a lot of people this year with taxes is, um, you know, they've made, they've made more money in their checking account for the first couple of times in a few years. So don't forget to report that in your taxes. Because for many years, we've had customers just take those 1099s and throw them away. And now if you've got 20, 30 grand, 100 grand in an account, you've you got to pay taxes on that interest it makes. So don't forget about that. Um, that makes a big difference. Um, one of the, we had, so for the summary today, we have some fun facts. And then a couple of tax things. If you're looking at your tax return, some things that you do not want to forget if you do stuff with us that you pay attention to. Um, I'll probably start out with that and then we'll do the fun facts today just so we make sure we hit them. We're seeing a lot of accountants miss a few things. So please, please double check your tax return. We're happy to look at it, but double check your tax return. So if you have a QCD distribution, qualified charitable distribution. So qualified, which means IRA type account, charity. distribution. And what this is basically is let's say your standard deduction is $13,000 and you don't give $13,000 to church away. If you're over 70 and a half and you give some of that money straight out of your IRA to church, that money is not considered taxable income. It is a distribution though. So on your 1040, which is your tax return, the front page, there's a line that says 4A and 4B. I should have printed one, Hayden. 4A is qualified distributions, how much money you pulled out, and 4B is how much is taxable. This is a big thing you can take advantage of on your tax return. So if you're giving money to church this way, you have to check your tax return. Because the 1099 is not going to say that money went to church. It's going to say you pulled the money out. Charles Schwab is not going to tell you if your charity is a good charity or not. They're not in the business of approving charities. So you have to put that in there. So if you did this, if you gave money out of your IRA as part of your RMD, but remember it's 70 and a half, it's not 73. So they never changed the law from 70 and a half. It used to be 70 and a half, you pulled money out. Now it's 73. If you're 70 and a half, you can give money out of your IRA to, to charity and it is not considered to be taxable income. But you have to make sure for, if you gave $5,000, 4A would say 5,000 and 4B would say zero. Because the zero is the part that says it's not taxed. I add the thing there is, yeah. uh, you actually don't pay taxes on it. So you can actually give more. Yep, absolutely. That's 100% because, because you're doing that for years. it's a great thing to do, and, um, but make sure your accountant does it. Because I'm telling you, half of the people that are doing this, when I see their returns, are not getting the deduction. Right. You have to tell your charity, or your accountant. Charity didn't care. Okay, the other one is the backdoor Roth IRA. We're not supposed to call it that because there's some kind of questionable thing, but that's basically what it is. This is where 
you make a after tax IRA contribution, which means you're putting in money after tax, you're not taking a tax deduction. If you don't already have an IRA, a traditional IRA with money in it, that's pre-tax, you can then convert this money to a Roth IRA and there are no taxes owed. But you have to have earned income. This is a way to fund a Roth IRA through the back door where there's no income limits. Right now, if you make over $230,000 as a married couple, you cannot put money in a Roth IRA. But you can do this. But you have to do Form 8606, which you tell the IRS, I did an after-tax IRA contribution. That form just says, I put $7,500 in after tax. You got to tell them. You can still do these contributions with us until April 15th for last year. We got six more days. People are still coming in today. <laughs> now, that same thing applies here. If you do an after tax, 4A is gonna say, let's say I, convert, I, did it, I was married, I did $15,000 in 4A, I, and then I converted it to Roth, it's not taxable because it's after tax money. For, so 4A and 4B, that's where our office lives right now. 4A and 4B on your 1040. So do not forget those things right there. So those are the two biggest mistakes we're seeing. I would say when we see a customer's tax return, almost half of them have to be amended because they're not doing this. So I told you. <laughs> so, and if you're not doing a charitable distribution for um, out of your IRA, think about it. It's like Frank said, it's a great way for you to lower your income and give more to the charities you believe in. You know, if, if you're not paying 12% taxes on it, you got the ability to give more money and see no difference. So I'm all about that, personally. Okay. So, so yeah, well that, you can't be your own charity, I don't think. I mean, you, you can get away with it, but I'm not, that's why, this is why Charles Schwab won't approve a charity because you have what's called, um, actually a approved charity list with the IRS. If you guys ever want to see if your charity is actually in good standing with the IRS, there's actually a search tool where you can look it up. So we've got a, a couple of foundations we managed and one of the charities they wanted to give money to had not done their tax return in two years. So they weren't approved of the IRS. However, I know another customer wrote them a check and they cashed it and then we couldn't send them money because the charity were, that we worked with went out and saw if that charity had done their tax return. And there's a little bit of a question here. So there's what's called a 501c3. A 501c3 organization has to do a tax return. It has to get approved by the IRS. A church does not. So a lot of times if you're giving money to a church, they're not doing tax forms. But if you're giving money like the Rotary Club, they're supposed to do a tax form. And in order for you to get a tax deduction, that charity has to do the tax form. Now this really matters more in 2026 because in 2026, the standard deduction goes down a lot. So in the past, you know, people used to really pay attention when they're giving money away to charity, but the, when these tax laws change in two years, based on who wins this election, they're very likely you're going to be paying a lot more attention to this. Because right now, everybody just does a standard deduction because most people don't give more than fifteen dollars to $30,000 a year away. That's all about to be changing if some of these laws change in 26. Okay, so let's go over a couple of fun facts. Um, I don't know if you guys saw this, but who, what country determines your gasoline prices? No. No. We do because of production, but not really. Who, who, who actually consumes more gasoline every year? Who consumes more gasoline every year? A lot more. No. Our cars get more miles per gallon. We're driving less miles. Your fuel economy is going up on your vehicle. Got some bunch of cars in there too. A lot of hybrids. Let's try and mess it up. Cuba. <laughs> Good. I think those 50s aren't being made very many. Those, those they don't get very new cars there. It's mainly China, right? If you look at the number one growth driver of gasoline demand, it's mainly China. If you want to look at why gas prices have gone down relative to inflation, 
It's because China's economy, their middle class, is not growing. They're dying. And so when you look at um, the number one driver of energy is not us. It's actually Asia. And there's a new country that's really taken over, probably for us, in the future. And it's likely to be India. If you look at India right now, they have a $3.5 trillion economy. China, a $17.8 trillion economy. But remember, China came out uh, about a year ago and said, we have overcounted our population. We have 150, more, less, 150 million less people than we said we did, and they're all under age 40. Now, what is critical about people being under age 40? The poverty. Huh? The poverty. That's true. But what also, do most people have kids after 40 or under, or under 40? Right? So if you think about the one-child policy, which aborted lots, millions of kids and from 1970 to today, they changed that policy, but they changed it 50 years after they put it in place. Well, that means 50, you 60-year-old know, people are unlikely to have more kids. Right? And so when you look at China, they're running out of people. And they have a ton of debt. So when we look at the future of the world, you got India here, which is the largest country on earth. They have the most people on earth. Not even close. And it's very, very likely, as you're seeing, India right now is seeing tons of factories being built. They're moving those factories from China to India. They're moving those factories here. They're moving those factories to Mexico. They're moving those factories to Vietnam. But the number one driver for global economic growth is probably going to be China. And one of the articles I looked at now is China's probably economy is going to be growing probably about 9% a year, which is unheard of. And they're likely to be 40% of all economic growth in the world will be made in the country of India. Um, and so the middle class of India could reach up to 800 million people. That's 800 million cars, right? That's 800 million people that want to travel the world. You know, one of the things that if you look at Europe, whenever COVID hit, if you go to the, um, Italy, the, the Chinese love to travel to Venice. And so one of the things that's happened in Europe since COVID is these Chinese tourists have not come back. And everybody wonders why, but they may not exist. There just may not be any people. And so if you look at China right now, they have built twice as many housing units as people in their country. I mean, they're having a debt implosion right now because it's all on borrowed money. And so India right now sits here with all these people with a much smaller economy and a growing middle class. And remember, what's cool about India is they're a democracy. And they speak English, kind of. And so... That's a big beneficiary for us doing business with somebody, right? Because they're not likely to, you know, democracies don't tend to fight each other very often. So that's something that's also playing a part. Um, but we're, we're likely to see this part of the stock market grow a lot more. And so if you ever look at one of the investments in our managed models, you'll see that we have emerging markets excluding China. Because one of the probably one of the best ways to make money over the next 10 years is going to be investing in a country like this. India's got one big problem though. Well, two big problems, the caste system and infrastructure. They don't have any roads. And you gotta have roads and you gotta have access to the people in order for them to go to work. And that's a big problem. But they're building it. And they're working on it. Um, and so that was a pretty cool little fact. Another um, fact, I don't know if you guys saw this. Um, is Ivy League colleges. They're about to break 100 grand a year on average. Right now they're up to $90,000 a year. If you look at Cornell is $92,000 a year. The University of Pennsylvania is $92,288 a year. Dartmouth and Brown are $91,000 a year. Amazingly enough, even though these schools are charging 
over $90,000 a year to go there, the number of people that want to go up there was still up 9%. 9% more people applied than the year before. And remember, most of these schools have a 1 in 20 accept rate. That's right. And that's to pay $90,000 a year to go to college. Um, where I went to college is now up to $93,000 a year, which is crazy. You know, it's very, very expensive. Harvard actually saw a decrease for the first time recently. They were down 5% um, because of their political mess they caused. Um, one of the worst things you can do right now, if you're in um, any kind of institution, is make a political statement because our country's so polarized. You almost got to stay 50-50. And you saw that with Harvard. Harvard, for the first time, has less people wanting to go there. Harvard was always known as the school. You, you know, Harvard, you know, and now less people are applying to go there versus other schools. Um, another big thing you guys might have noticed is State Farm. State Farm was downgraded from A to B and BB plus for the long term. You, everyone might have noticed their insurance um, premiums went up. Well, State Farm is the largest insurance company in the United States, if not the world. I'm not sure I didn't look at the world stuff. But they are running out of money. They have a deterioration in policy. So, so what the report came in from AMB Best said deteriorating in the policy surplus, which means deterioration of cash, weakening balance sheet metrics. Now, what does that mean, right? That means your assets are worth what? Less. Now, why? what event would cause State Farm to lose so much money in their investments? Well, that's the cash, right? Yeah. That hurricane hit Florida. I forget what island it was. Was it Sanibel Island? They just wiped out the island. Like right now, one out of five homeowners in Florida are not carrying insurance on their house because they can't afford it. I mean, you know, you're probably going to see a lot of people move here to Tennessee because, again, this is a very inexpensive place to live. If you live in Florida and it costs you $6,000 a year to insure a $300,000 house, does that affect your retirement? Yeah. Yeah, but, but, but Florida is seeing a lot worse trend because um, when you look at how much money the houses are worth versus the insurance cost, but you, I mean, look at a map, right? I don't have a map in here, but if you have a map and look at Florida, it's a swamp. You're in a swamp next to the ocean. I mean, what did the Bible say? Build your house in the swamp? No, build your house on the rock, right? And so if you, I mean, the Bible, the, 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 the story, the, 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 uh, the song, you know, and so you're like, you don't build your house on, in the swamp. And so, if you look at Florida, I mean, just look at it. It's a terrible place to build a house. I mean, it's all in the swamp, and you, know, the, you got more hurricanes, you know, and, and it just, you know, and there's just more people. I mean, it used to be there was a bunch of trees between you and the beach, and those trees, they cut them down, they hurt the view. <laughs> I mean, if you, want, if, if you ever want to have some fun, just go to Miami. You see all those skyscrapers right on the ocean? Oh, my goodness. I hope they built them deep in the rock, <laughs> you know, because what could happen? I mean, you're on the ocean in a skyscraper, like the ocean's where that thing is. I mean, craziness, right? And so um, State Farm is seen there, but also the biggest thing is these interest rates. When, you're lock, when you lock in for 30 years at 2% on, on an investment, and the Federal Reserve raises those rates to 8%, you guys going to pay full price for that investment? Nope. So you, you go out there and you put $100 million in that thing, and now it's worth $50 million or less than a bunch of people getting car accidents, and they need money to pay for it. You've got to take the loss because you've got to sell that $100 million for $50 million to pay for those cars. You know, Farm Bureau, second year in a row, they didn't make money. First time in their history. And that's Farm Bureau, Tennessee. That's not Farm Bureau of Florida. That's not Farm Bureau of California. That's Farm Bureau of Tennessee. <laughs> and what that comes down to is these investments. Um, the uh, locking all this money in, in low interest rates, and it's very, very possible, which we'll talk about this in a little bit with the Federal Reserve, it's very, very impossible these low interest rates aren't coming back ever for a long time. Because if you look at the trends right now, there's a lot of things happening which hurt <coughs> 
our ability to um, get low interest rates again. But this is killing uh, State Farm. Um, also, another thing they said about State Farm is their general umbrella and commercial, commercial line multi perils are just to the roof. And of course, general umbrella mainly refers to if you get in a car accident, right? You know, if you ever drive to Florida, what do you see on the billboards of? I can still see it in my head. Morgan and Morgan. Morgan and Morgan. Morgan and Morgan. Personal injury lawyers, right? You know, uh, yeah, Alexander, he's in every state. That guy, I don't even know, I can't, I, I, he, needs, he needs to get a new last name because I can't pronounce it. I'm just telling you right now. But, I mean, he needs to be like Alexander Smith. You know, that's what he should have done. He should have changed his name to Smith. Um, um, but, you know, but the, uh, he would have made a lot more money because Morgan Morgan's a lot easier to remember than Alexander whatever. Um, and so, um, anyway, I'm not calling anybody for a lawsuit. But the thing is, um, this is really hurting State Farm. And so you're starting to see this ripple across, and you know, it's not unheard of that our government won't do a bailout of the insurance companies. You know, because as you start seeing them going, as you see them start going down, don't be surprised that their lobbyists start saying what? Oh, we can't let State Farm go down. We can't let them lose money, right? I mean, I think it's wrong morally, but that's probably gonna come, you know, because if these companies keep losing money that's why your premiums are going up. You know, then they're also arguing too, like, well, why is the insurance going up? Well, because it costs more for your car. It costs more for your house. This is what inflation does. Inflation causes a lot of damage, and we're seeing it. Um, now, the other big one is um, credit card. Does anybody here use a rewards credit card? I do. I do. So credit cards last year generated $72 billion in fees to banks, um, where basically you bought something and that bank got, that merchant had to pay a percentage of that purchase to go over there. So they just, Visa and MasterCard just approved a settlement that could, uh, that will likely affect your rewards card. Okay, the first thing they approved was it reduces and caps the fees that are charged to retailers for five years. They can't raise the fees for five years. But here's what it does. It allows the merchant to charge you more money based on what credit card you use. So if you use, like let's say, a Sapphire, Sapphire Reserve premium card or whatever with a $550 annual fee, you go out, you spend $100 at Walmart, they throw another dollar on there as a fee for using that credit card. And they can do that after you ring up the purchase. Think about that, right? So here you are, I mean, you go to Walmart, you walk in, you scan everything, you get the number, you use a credit card. Well, when you swipe that credit card, they now charge you a higher fee if it's a certain type of credit card. Did you get a receipt for that? Probably not. Because our whole system is set up on what? Well, you pay for it and you get the receipt. But it changes when you do the point of purchase. So it may, I don't know how it's gonna show up. It may show up on your credit card statement. Like, well, you used the Sapphire Reserve, you lost this much money this month. Well, what other damage any card you use? You use a credit card, debit card, anything. Well, that, small retailers have always been doing that, Darla, and they can, but now they're letting you do it at the credit card level. But the credit card company will collect that fee for the merchant. So basically, it'll be a, um, you swipe and the credit card company charges you money. So you might be getting 2% cash back, which I get on my cards, but now you're paying 1% to get 2% cash back. So to me, you're only getting, and of course, the banks like that because if they charge you more money, you're more likely to pay 20% interest on it, right? <laughs> you know, because you're getting charged more to use the credit card. And so it's expected <coughs> that this will result in a $30 billion reduction in credit card fees over the next five years, or about $6 billion a year or less for the banks and the credit card companies. Now, 
as you said, Darla, the, the local vendors, your, your people around Midville Manchester, they already charge a fee and they may just put it on. But your big guys, your Walmarts, your Amazons, this is what really affects. Because they're the ones that are a little bit smarter. They're a little bit more sophisticated on using technology. And so very, very likely they're going to pass this on to the consumer. You know, if you ever fly to an airport now, they have these things called um, business lounges where you get like little crappy food and sodas. And these credit card companies have offered all these lounges free. So they're like the worst place you could ever go because there's so many people in line to get, you know, pretzel um, that you can't walk and you're probably going to get the flu because everyone's this close. I hate going to them. You know, and so when I fly, I used to go there because when I was growing up, my dad flew a lot, so um, we got him for free, and it was, you know, you had a chair. Now you're, like, fighting somebody for a chair, and they're putting, there's so many discarded dishes, you can't move. Well, that's because these rewards cards have come out and said, you get the free executive lounge. And so these people want to use that because they're paying the fee for it, but they haven't expanded the sizes of the, the building. They're the same size as they were when I was a kid. There's a lot more people in this country, a lot more people flying. Just go to the Nashville airport, don't believe me. It looks a lot different. <laughs> I mean, you know, and so that's one thing um, to factor in here is you're gonna need to watch this because the next three or four, now this has not been approved by the federal court yet, but MasterCard and Visa have said this is what they're gonna do. And MasterCard and Visa are the big players and they got the big money. So what do you think that's gonna happen? Pretty likely that's gonna happen. So pay attention. We're going to do a little podcast and some more of the details on it. But look at your rewards card. Now, Darla had a question. Um, she asked me yesterday. I thought it was pretty interesting. It was about that Baltimore Bridge. So if you guys have seen the news, um, everybody's been saying, oh, man. I remember she, she's, I, I, don't, I don't ever listen to the news. I read the news, and I think that's an important thing for everyone to do because, um, you know, if I watch a news channel and there's some pretty person on there, I'm probably going to pay more attention to them than I should. And if you think about if you read the news, it's much harder to, um, it's much harder to be manipulated. Videos are, and audio is very easy to manipulate because you don't realize, like I was, we were watching a Netflix series about um, eating, not eating meat. And they kept repeating everything as a, as a psychological tool to indoctrinate you into not eating meat. They kept repeating it over and over again. And of course, I'm, I've got my own nutritional views, but if you look at red meat and you dissect red meat, it's got the most essential proteins on the planet. So if you eat a low fat red meat, it is the healthiest meat you can eat. I mean, I've done, personally gone to a lab and seen how, how everything dies as it gets off that cow. And um, they were talking about how red meat was terrible for you. Well, they put all these people on this weight loss diet and they were eating non-red meat. Well, they all gained weight. The ones eating red meat did better because it has more essential proteins in it. But the way the video was done is they kept repeating, red meat will kill you, red meat will kill you. And, then, and so in your mind, you start thinking, what? Red meat's going to kill me. And so the Baltimore Bridge is kind of similar, in my opinion, because everybody's been saying all these crazy things about it. And there was a little tidbit about it yesterday, which is kind of interesting, is they've already built channels, temporary channels, around the bridge to get shipping in. <laughs> so the news story is the bridge is in the middle of the ocean or the, whatever the sea, whatever it is, and they're unloading it one container at a time. But guess what the ships are doing? They're just going around it. Now, the cool thing about the eastern part of the United States is there's a lot of cities on the ocean. And there's these things called railroad tracks and these things called roads, highways. And all they got to do to go around Baltimore is go to Boston, go to New York, go to another port. There's a lot of ports in the East Coast. If you want to say there's one thing about America, we don't lack ports in the East Coast. Now, we lack ports in Tennessee, not a lot of oceans here, <laughs> but we do not lack ports <laughs> on the East Coast. <laughs> and unlike the Mississippi River, the ocean hasn't dried up yet. <laughs> and so that's uh, with the Baltimore Bridge, there probably will not be any major impact. The number one impact will be the temporary expense on a couple things because they had to reroute the ships. And so, um, but it, 
it would cost four or five billion dollars. But when you're spending seven trillion dollars a year, you know, we did as fast as I just said it, it was spent, right? So that's the um, um, the unfortunate truth. But so obviously, when they rebuild the bridge, the federal government will come in and they'll pay for it. Um, there's actually a um, part of the law for the insurance companies where they basically are not liable for losses above a certain point. They have a limited in liability. And the reason why, that's why everything you have is so cheap. All this food we got was shipped is so chi cheap to do because they limit how much money the shipping takes. Actually, there's a really dumb law. If you, wanna, if you wanna send something to your congressman, it's called the Jones Act. Everybody likes semi-trucks next to them on the highway? Well, you can fault this law right here. Okay, so the Jones Act was packed in, passed in the early 1900s. And what it stated was that if you had a ship that went from one American port to another American port without stopping, it had to be built in America, the ship, and had to be crewed by Americans. So if you've ever noticed, when you go on a cruise ship, they don't typically go from Miami to Port Canaveral because it's illegal. They gotta pay a fine or get an exception. And so your semi-trucks are driven by anybody with a license in North America. So if somebody from Mexico is driving next to you, don't be surprised because they're allowed to do that because American truck drivers are allowed to drive in Mexico. But a Mexican ship can't go from New York to Baltimore because of this stupid law. And you think about our country, if you look at where I grew up in Missouri, you got this thing called the Mississippi River and this thing called the Missouri River. And there's a ton of rivers that go through our country. And the Tennessee River and all this stuff ships right through Chad. I mean, everything ships around. But, but non-American ships can't use those rivers. And they can't use those port facilities in the Great Lakes. They can't go from Detroit to, you know, to, um, I don't know, it's another city, on, to Chicago. They got to they gotta be an American ship. And so what that does is a lot of these big containers they go to Baltimore, they go to Los Angeles, they go to South Carolina, then they get on a, a semi-truck and they drive it to your house. Well, it'd be a lot cheaper and actually better for the environment too because a ship doesn't use as much diesel as a semi-truck does. And so one of the main reasons why we don't use our oceans and our rivers very well is because of this dumb law called the Jones Act. So if you look it up, it's one of the dumbest laws. No one's paying attention to it. But it means, that's why, if you think about cruise ships, there's not a lot of cruise ships that go from Boston to New York. They gotta go somewhere else first. They gotta go out to sea, then they can come. It's a really dumb law. But it really affects shipping because if you think about shipping, there's all of those great lakes, all those canals, all that, those rivers in our country. Nothing, nobody has what we have. Nobody, if you go to Germany, they gotta go through three river systems to ship through their country, and it's the size of Texas. And right now, you can sell from New Orleans to Minnesota. <laughs> Nobody has what we have. But this law imperils only American ships can traverse that river. Anyway, number one thing, and that affects every, what it costs because it's a lot cheaper to ship stuff by rail and by boat than it is by truck. And that's why our highways are so much bigger too. Anyway. I think the good side of that. What's that? The good side is if you had a foreign uh, ship internal to the U.S., what damage they could do? Maybe. But at the end of the day, like, if somebody's willing to break the rules, they're going to break the rules. Um, but ultimately, you know, you can also put on a manifest the majority are Americans and they're not. It's, the main issue is if you have a semi-truck, they don't have to be an American to have a license and drive here in America. So, uh, you know, it creates a really big economic problem from a um, business standpoint. Because if you look at all these cities on these rivers, they're dying. It's the reason they don't change. They don't count lobbyists and stuff. They don't want to change. I, I don't know. I don't, I don't think people are paying attention to it. I think they don't, don't even realize it's there. I know that's crazy. I think people don't even pay attention. There is a, there's an agreement between Canada, Mexico, and the United States as far as CDL drivers. Yeah, for definitely. Well, they've never, see, they updated the truck agreement, but they never updated the boat agreement. And to me, if you think about it, like, 
if you look how our country was developed right, it was all up in the Northeast on those rivers and all in the ocean. And now it's in Phoenix. Phoenix? What's in Phoenix besides the desert? And, you know, it's in, you know, Texas, which has no rivers. And it's because everything's shipped by truck now. And you've seen this progression. It started with the river and the ocean, and then it started with um, rail. But if you look at China, the Yangtze River, which is a canal, do you guys know that? It's actually above the ground. They built it above. That whole thing is a canal that goes through the whole country. But that river is actually above the ground <laughs> because they just keep building bigger canals because it gets out of its banks. And that's how they ship stuff. Well, our country, we don't have to do that. You got the Mississippi. There's this place called Cairo, Illinois, which is a major um, shipping hub. Only 1,000 people live there now. There used to be like 100 because it was a shipping hub. And that's all gone because of that law. Now, but if you want to get efficient and you want to, get, and you want to reduce the, the cost of your food you ate and the cost of your stuff, shipping it by boat's a lot cheaper. Not to mention how many fatalities you save on the interstate because that, yeah, that boat hit that bridge. And, and, and actually, all those guys that died were immigrants. If you guys knew that, they were all immigrants working at midnight, filling potholes, which nobody here wants to do. I can tell you that for sure. <laughs> and they all, they're the ones that died. It wasn't, and, and that's why they're not even paying attention to them. That's terrible. But those are the guys doing the work. But that is so rare. I mean, how many boats have I seen go through the Mississippi River? Barges and barges and barges. So, I mean, it's just so rare. But anyway, um, but that's, that's one thing that would be a great thing to change um, to make our country more viable, you know, because most of our stuff in our country is, most of our money is made internally. We're not a great exporter anymore. We used to be the, a big exporter of goods. And this, this law right here changed a lot of that because we became more of a self-driven economy. Like you notice our economy is not in a recession, but the rest of the world is, <laughs> pretty much. And that's because of that. Do you have any questions about any of this stuff? Sorry, I'm talking too much. Is the reason why 99% uh, of the cruise liners are registered or licensed out of Panama? Is that because Liberia. of regulations or, tax, or taxation? Yeah, what's well, Liberia? Because they can dump in the water, right? They can dump everything in the ocean. They don't have to clean it. Oh, uh, in our regulations, they have to. Oh, yeah. Sure. We have EPA regulations, and Liberia does not. Okay. And so. Um, also, just there are no regulations either. There's no, there's no, um, you know, minimum wage. There's no, <laughs> you know, if you're a ship that's out of California now, and remind, remind me that the minimum wage is now twenty dollars an hour. They're not paying those people twenty dollars an hour. So at the end of the day, it's it's all about money. And so that's the problem with the ship, right? It's movable. You know, <laughs> you know, you don't like the laws here, you go somewhere else. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's all you got to do. I mean, that and that's why those ships are there. It's also, it hurt them because whenever COVID happened, all these other companies, they got bailouts, right? Guess who didn't get the bailouts? The cruise ships, because they're not American. And so they went to Congress and said, wait a minute, we, we have all these American jobs, and they do. And so what did the United States Congress tell them? Huh, become Americans. We'll give you money. What did they say? Ah, oh, we're good. We're good. We want to keep dumping in the ocean. I mean, it's terrible. I mean, I hate it. That's, to me, that's the worst pollution there is, is when they're dumping everything in the ocean. I mean, I've lived in California, and I've seen raw sewage going in Malibu into the ocean next to Surfrider Beach. You know that famous beach from the Beach Boys? That is where they dump the sewer at. I've seen the pipe. Now, they've since fixed it, but there was a kid I went to college with who died from a bacteria a surfing on that beach because it came out of the, the system, wasn't cleaned. They dump raw sewage in the ocean. That's nasty, um, you know. So um, I mean, it can't be good. Okay, so uh, not to get on the negative because I think I just did it there. Um, the uh, a couple of things to talk about here are, are just talking a little bit about are we going to go into a recession or not, and then some facts on the economy that really affect inflation as well as a market update. So as I was walking in here. The bond market was rallying and the stock market was going down um, today as I was coming in. Um, but what we're looking at right now is in the first quarter of this year, 
earnings are expect earnings and revenue, so profit and revenue are supposed to go about 3%. For the second quarter, they're expecting profit to go up 9.4% and revenue to go up 4.7. For the third quarter, 8.5% profit growth, 5.2% revenue. And for the fourth quarter, 17.5% profit growth and 5.8% revenue. You, if you look at U.S. companies, whenever inflation really started hitting home and they started realizing the Federal Reserve was going to what they were going to do, they went down. The stock market had a pretty big drop in 2022. And companies were struggling. It's very clear now that companies have now adjusted to the new normal. And companies are very quick to adjust, um, faster than anybody else, because they're here to make money. You know, if you look at one of the most famous companies, Walt Disney, terribly run company, right when COVID hit, they shut down their theme parks, where by the way, they make 75% of their money. Do you guys hear what percentage I said? 75% of their profit. And they put all their money into TV shows through Disney Plus, where they didn't make any money. <laughs> so what did they announce they're going to do last week? $60 billion more for new theme park stuff. Because if you're smart, right, and you make 75% of your money in one place, where do you put your money? Where do you make your money? You know? And so their company, though, stock's gone up because everybody likes the fact that they're smartening it up. You know, and they also, their CEO said, we think the culture wars are over. We're staying out of that stuff. Smart decision, right? If, you know, if you're, you know, if you look at here in the room right now, we got Republicans and Democrats. One of the worst things <laughs> you can do is pick a side too extreme because you're going to make their side mad. In America, the way we're set up, businesses should stay as much as they can out of politics to make money. It's hard to do, but they should. And so um, if you look at what we're looking at this year, we're looking at a very, very big return to profit. The number one reason why the stock market has had such a rally going into this year is because of um, these profit numbers going up. Because these companies have found a way to make money. Now, the big question people say is, and they've been saying, is are we going into a recession or not? Well, my favorite thing is economists have predicted nine of the last five recessions. Brian got it. <laughs> um, and so because most of the time when they predict a recession, it's about a 50-50 chance. They always are saying recession, and that doesn't mean it's going to happen. Now, what would, be some, what would be the main reason why we probably would not see a recession this year? Yeah. Every politician, I don't care if you're a Democrat, or Republican, Independent, what is the main job of politicians? <laughs> to what? Well, yeah. I mean, like, like, people talk about the deficit, right? What's the number one cause of the deficit in our country? On what? No, it's Social Security and Medicare. So who's going to run for office and say, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to cut Social Security, and I'm going to cut Medicare, and I'm going to cut defense. Because where we spend most of our money is what? Those three things. Now, to my knowledge, I've not heard Joe Biden or Donald Trump say that. Because if they do say it, what's going to happen? They're not going to get elected. And is that their fault or is that our fault? Because we don't want to have a serious conversation. The serious conversation is, unless you modify some of these things, you don't have enough money. Which means you've got to raise taxes and you've got to cut some people out of some money. That's the only way to make it work. But we won't have that conversation, so inflation will keep going up. And, you're, and what you're paying for for food is going to keep going up, and your standard of living is going to keep going down. Right? That's what's going to happen. That's what we know as investors. And so <clears throat> if you look at the number one reason, it's like when Joe Biden says, um, I'm going to forgive everybody's student loans yesterday. And then I just told you Ivy League schools are now charging what? $92,000 a year. Well, hold on a second. Why are all of us subsidizing Ivy League schools, which 95% of the kids don't get into? 
Why are we subsidizing those schools? Does that make sense? Do you have to go to Harvard to be an engineer? <coughs> are most people going to be an engineer and go to Harvard? No. Are most engineers going to go? So why are we as a country subsidizing schools? And when, you, when Biden goes out and says we're going to forgive $20,000, what does that tell the school to do? Raise tuition. Because, hey, if they can't pay, Uncle Sam will. And, you know, Bill Haslam did the same thing. You know, Bill Haslam went in. What did he say with Motlow? It's going to be free. And the tuition went from $2,000 to $5,800 the first year. Because when Motlow heard free, what did they hear? Oh, new campuses. <laughs> more people. More expenses. And, by the way, if I'm not mistaken, I'm not looking at this fact tomorrow, but the graduation rate for college went up 1% in the state. We spent all of our money to get a 1% more people. That's a Republican, and our current president is a Democrat, right? So they're both guilty. You can't make an argument. But the number one thing is, if you keep telling schools that, they get this, that there is no limit to what they'll charge, are you going to be surprised when they build bigger sports stadiums? I mean, I went to college at Pepperdine, and they're building a $350 million new sports complex. And it's going to be awesome. It's got an infinity pool. You can look up on the ocean right after the game, you know, and it's going to be just gorgeous. But is it needed? No, but it's going to make their sports team more attractive because they're building a whole sports complex. And that'll, and their, the whole part of them doing that is, is like Alabama, right? Alabama, the number one thing that's helped that school is their football team. Their football team has helped their academic scores go up, their college basketball team get better. They've helped every part of that school get better. So if you're competing with Alabama, what do you want to do? You want to be Alabama. Why do you think so many SEC teams have hired coaches from Alabama? Now, Frank's here, and I don't really care for Alabama, so I'll tell him that. It's just giving Frank a hard time because I like Tennessee. But the point is, if you look at the competition, Frank's from Alabama, so if you guys want to haze somebody at the end, it's okay. Um, I'm, <laughs> I'm just I'm just. I'm just kidding. I'm just harassed you, right? But the, the, the point is, is that's the whole thing. So Pepperdine's seeing that. All these schools are seeing that and saying, wait a minute. If we've got a really good basketball team, our academic scores go up. You know, and so if you want to get into Alabama or you want to get into UT, it's really getting hard now because they're making it almost impossible to get in. <laughs> but the whole point of education is what? To educate people with skills to do jobs, not make it hard to get into school. But any time... You write a blank check, the price of everything's going to go up. That's how it works. Okay, so if you look at recessions, in 2001, we had that recession. What really caused that recession? Anybody know? Never forget. Uh... Oh, yeah, 9 11. Which everybody just forgot. <laughs> um, 2008's recession was caused by the financial crisis, but it was really caused also too, remember OPEC? OPEC went in, they shot the price of gasoline to $5 a gallon because Saudi Arabia went in and they said, we are mad about you getting involved in Iraq, so we're gonna make you pay. We're gonna make the price of oil go up. So what did a bunch of American oil drillers start doing? Hey, we're gonna frack. We're gonna learn some way to get this oil because it's getting so expensive, we can make money. <coughs> The joke's on them, right? Guess who controls oil prices now? The United States. Because when you try to pee on your customer, it ain't going to go well. Doesn't matter who you are. That's what happened. But that's not predictable, right? Nobody predicted this. You know, we could have had a financial crisis last year when those banks were getting in trouble. I remember I told you State Farm's in trouble. All State's in trouble. Farm Bureau's in trouble. They're seeing the same, some of the same problems you would see in a financial crisis. They got a bunch of money that's worthless. But is there a financial crisis right now? There's not. But if there's an event, could, there one, could one happen? You better believe it. 2020, anybody see COVID coming? Or more importantly, did anybody really think they were going to shut the country down for COVID? I'll be the first one to tell you, I didn't think they were. I'm like, they're not going to shut the country down because of a virus that kills a very small percentage of people. Sure enough, they did. It wasn't a good decision. Now you look back and say, that was really dumb. 
And I thought it was done back then. But that doesn't mean it didn't happen. 2022, we had a big stock market shot because the Federal Reserve said inflation's transitory. It's going to go away. It's going to go away on its own. It's not a big deal. It's over with. And then about February, they're like, wait a minute. This thing's uh, it's getting out of control. <laughs> so we're going to jack the rates up as high as possible. Even today, like last week, they started saying, well, wait a minute. We know we said we we're going to cut rates, but we, we just said that back in March, and it's April, and we're not sure. It's been three weeks. Three weeks, they all changed their mind. Ugh, I want to throw up. Um, and so, uh, typically, when you look at recessions, they're unpredictable. That's the main point. But they are caused by some outside event with something else. Like, I can tell you right now, State Farm is in trouble. They're running out of money. But if people, if all you guys pay your premiums, and you pay the higher premiums, they're going to get more money, and they're going to be fine. And State Farm's not going out of business. It's more than that. That are in the next few years we could have a sure. serious banking. But the only reason why you you have a banking crisis, right, is if people start losing their jobs. Because if you ask my wife, what's the one thing she doesn't want to lose? Mm. Well, maybe not. We'll see. Just kidding. Besides that, huh? No. What what do most women want to keep more than anything? Their house. So as long as you have a job and you can get a job, people will work more jobs to get, keep their house. If you look at right now, everything's costing more. Because everything's costing more, people are working more hours. The number one way the economy works is when things cost more, people got to work more hours. When your standard of living goes down, you don't live on less, you work 50 hours a week. It's American tradition. If you're feeling really good, like people were after COVID and they had all this money in their checking account. What did they all start doing? They all started retiring. Then they started costing more. What are they doing now? They're going back to work. It's because economics rules, not politics. Economics rules. If you don't believe it, just look at how many people that are over working age are still working. They're not all working because they want to be there. And so if you think about those banks, if you bought a bunch of loans, or bonds at 2% interest, and now it's 8%. You got a big loss on your books. And so if people start not paying on their mortgages and they lose their house, they then got to sell that mortgage. See, that loss is not recognized right now. That loss has not occurred. I've got a 2% mortgage on my house. The mortgage loss on my house is $300,000. The Federal Reserve, who has that loan, has a rocket mortgage through them, has a $300,000 loss in their books. And as long as the Federal Reserve is around, I mean the Federal, not Freddie Mac, not Federal Reserve, um, they're not going to sell that. But a lot of these banks, if you go to downtown St. Louis, I was there with Hayden um, last week, and we were sitting at the top of the 360 restaurant, and on top of the restaurant, we're looking at all these buildings empty. 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 And, and Hayden and I could see it because the lights were on it, and there was no desk. There were empty rooms. Well, some bank is holding that mortgage loan, and there's no one paying rent. So what's that mean? I mean, the, the Bell South building sold yesterday. This building had a $300 million loan on it in 2006. It sold yesterday for $4 million. Wow. Now, I'm sure the bondholders still have some of the equity in it because they didn't sell it that cheap for that reason. But here you have a building that's probably 50 stories tall where, where AT&T used to be headquartered in St. Louis or Bell South. And that building is empty, empty. Some bank is holding that note. I think it's actually U.S. Bank is the one who's holding the note. And so that's a big loss. Now, as, and they don't have to, but they don't have to recognize that loss until you don't pay on your mortgage. Because then when they run out of cash to make the payment, they got to sell that note to generate more cash. And so financial crisis is only occur typically when some other big event occurs. So you ask me when the next recession is going to be? It's going to be when an event occurs. And every guy is going to be like, well, why did they do 2% mortgages? That was a dumb idea. I'm telling you right now it's a dumb idea. I'm telling you it's a dumb idea from the beginning. But the point is, is that's the challenge.
you know, and the Federal Reserve is working on it. Right now, they're burning $95 billion of those mortgages a month. So are you saying that as we went through like 10, 12, 15 years, 2%, 3%, 4%, mm-hmm. that the Fed should have incremented? They never should have done it. The points, I mean, should have not incremented points. Uh, yeah, well, so what, what, if you look at disasters, right, you have financial disasters and you have natural disasters. And these are re- types of recessions. If you look at a recession, you've got a financial recession and you've got a natural disaster recession or a disaster, not called natural, just a disaster. COVID is a disaster. You tell everybody they got to stick in their home, they got to be stuck in their home. Well, what's the first thing people did when they get out of their house? They went shopping, revenge travel, right? You don't have to pay people to spend money out of a disaster because everybody's been sitting at home saving money. And what are they ready to do? Go travel. Um, A financial situation is different because if you go bankrupt, if you lose your house, you can't get another subsidized loan by the government for seven years. So how you deal with that crisis is different than how you deal with this crisis. They were yeah. saying yesterday on the news or one day this week, you know, they're talking about disasters rates and stuff. They said they'd never be negative rates again, you know, that always uh, of course because that was because that's what caused part of this problem. Well and, and what's causing the problem is if you look at the numbers, which I'll go into um, the US government in 2019 had a debt of $22.7 trillion. They now have a debt of $33.167 trillion. The U.S. government spent $11 trillion. Now, when I say they spent the money, that means they printed $11 trillion. So can you be surprised if there's 30% more debt to 50% more debt? Things cost 30 to 50% more money? Hello, right? Now, the Federal Reserve had a balance sheet of $4.2 trillion when COVID hit. They, they, it rose to $9 trillion. They printed another $5 trillion. And now they're down to $7.4 trillion. Now, when you look at that, when you print that much money and you don't bring in a lot more people, that money becomes what? Worth less because you have only 10% more people in our country paying taxes on that money and using that money. Now, a lot of our money is used overseas, but what it does is, is you can, you can generate more money. The more kids, the more population you have, you can print money in equivalent with the population, but you can't print that much money and not have an impact, right? And it wasn't necessary because um, all it did was cause, like right now, let's look at, let's, let's use Hayden as an example. Let's say Hayden bought a house. So Hayden used to go to Freed Hardman. So let's say five, six years ago, he bought a house in Jackson. And let's say he bought that house at 2.5% interest. Mm-hmm, right? And now he gets a job offer here. But now he's got to get a house at what? So what does Hayden not do? He doesn't take the job offer. <laughs> no, sorry. <laughs> he doesn't want to be there with my kids. Um, but the 250 grand, the, it'll cost him $10,000 more a year in interest, minimum. What, well, 12,000? So they don't move. And so the reason why you're seeing houses not move is because if I move, I lose my interest rate. My payment goes up and my standard of living goes down. And so one of my good friends is, has a lot of storage units. So he was at the storage unit convention in Vegas last week. He said that storage units are down 30% from where they were three years ago because nobody's moving. Because most of the storage units are used for temporary moves. Then they, people forget about the stuff and leave in there and keep paying the fee. But the store, they built all these storage units because they thought people were going to move their houses. And now they're what? Empty. And so you're seeing a crisis. But, I mean, is this some big shock? I mean, how can everybody build a storage unit? You know what's going to happen, right? Supply and demand. And so when we look at, um, so let's look at, 
some quick facts before on inflation. So if you look at inflation, here are the things that are really impacting inflation. Well, first off, labor, or here's some facts in here. Labor force participation is going up. More people are working more hours, and there are more people working. And it's because of economics. If you can't afford to eat and you're able to work, what do you do? You go to work. You know, one of the things, I think it's in Proverbs, says a lazy man doesn't deserve to eat. <laughs> you know, and so if you don't believe that, go hike, go fasting and go hike Half Dome in Yosemite. See how hungry you'll be. Trust me, I've done it. Run out of water. Um, people are having to work more hours to pay their bills. We talked about the housing market. Housing stagnant. Most of the new houses are being bought by corporations. If you look at um, all the housing that's going to be built here in M Manchester, a lot of it's going to be owned by investors. It's not going to be owned by people. Because it's, they can't afford it. They're going to be renters. They're going to be permanent renters. Um, we all know commercial office space um, is struggling. You know, if you look at St. Louis, they did a no bail law. You, you get caught robbing somebody, you get released the same day. Well, what could go wrong? Right? And, um, and then they changed that, they've changed that, that thing recently, but that created a huge problem because nobody wanted to go downtown. I mean, who wants to be downtown? I remember I was coming back from seeing customers in St. Louis when they announced the verdict of uh, the officer that shot that guy, and they started trying to block the highway. Well, the last thing I want to be doing is stuck in a car with a Tennessee tag on it looking like me driving through St. Louis. I'm not doing it. So I drove all the way around the city so that I would not have to go near. I, it took an hour and a half out of my way because I could just see me being pulled out of a car and I don't have a gun. You know, and if I did have a gun, there's not going to be that many shots, right? Because, you know, they're going to, yeah, this guy from Tennessee, we're going to kill him. Pretty easy, right? Easy call. And so nobody wanted to go down to, um, and also availability of labor. You know, one of the number of things when companies are moving to is, they want to find workers. Um, I live in Warren County. I personally feel Warren County government's kind of anti-business. And so they, um, but factories are moving there anyway because 40% of the population works out of town. So the, the company says, well, if we put a business here, maybe I can convince some of those people to stop driving to Nashville and start driving to Morrison. And if you want to know why, you know, Manchester has been picked for this new mega site, that's a big reason why. Here we are in the center of all of these small towns and all these people driving to Nashville. You want to fix the traffic problem in Nashville? Get those people to work close to home. Yeah. And that's, what, and that's what's going to happen. Availability of labor. The reason why so many companies are moving to Austin is they need quality people. They don't want to be in Texas. Texas is hot and dry. Ugh. You know, I mean, nobody wants, I mean, you know, I mean, if you don't look at Texas, like, that's the prettiest state I've ever seen. Ugh. Sorry for the Texas customers watching. Um, and, and, and so if you look at um, the U.S. economy, it's still growing. You know, U.S. economy is now $25.4 trillion. I'm oh, sorry. $25.440 trillion. And we're growing at 3.4%. Um, it was 25 in 2022. We don't know 23 numbers yet. And if you look at inflation, China is running out of adults. China is running out of working age adults. One of the number one reasons why you're seeing inflation is for the last 20 years, we've relied on cheap labor from China. And now those people don't exist anymore. And so now you've got to rebuild all those factories somewhere else. And that's why inflation is going to have a hard time coming down, right? Because you can't just produce a trillion people that want to work 70 hours a week. You know, there's actually a thing in China where their youth unemployment is 50%. All these kids who grew up with the iPhones made by their parents are seeing their parents work six days a week. And what are they saying? I'm not doing that. This job sucks. You know, think about it. all those parents sacrificed so they could have what they have. And what are those kids saying? I'm not working like that. I'm not doing it. 
Um, and so they can't get their kids to work. Now you look at Vietnam, did you know Vietnam, 40% of kids that graduate high school or college from Vietnam have STEM degrees. So that country is what? It's going up the ladder. It's like the America in the 1950s. Um, and, the, and also the Federal Reserve is burning money. When Hayden moved from Jackson, which he didn't move from Jackson, he moved from Nashville. But if he moved from Jackson here and he sold his mortgage, he went, if he had had a house, he went from a 2% rate to an 8% rate. So what the Federal Reserve does is they say, well, you paid your mortgage off, Hayden. Guess what we're not going to do? We're not giving you a new one. You find it from somebody else. So they take that money and they burn it. They pull it out of the economy. So while the federal government's spending too much money, the Federal Reserve's what? <sighs> right? And so uh, it's, very, it's very good for our country. We got a Federal Reserve because they should be burning money. Because the only way you get inflation under control is you reduce the money supply. That's all you can do. And all these things are going on. And so what all this means, of course, is eventually the Federal Reserve is probably going to have to say, we're okay with inflation at 3%. By the way, when I started my career, they wanted inflation to be between 2 and 4%, not 2. This whole idea of like, the fact that you get the economy to just do the exactly the right thing is as dumb as it gets. I mean, nobody could predict 9-11. Nobody could predict a boat hitting a bridge. Nobody could predict these things. So the idea that the Federal Reserve can control everything so much to where they can get it to, like, just hit right there, it's not going to happen. There's just, it's just not that predictable. And the good news is, for us, is companies have found a way to make money. Big shock, right? And they're going to find to make more money. And almost all new investments last year are in artificial intelligence and in industrial plants. Because what they figured out is, you know, McDonald's, if you've got to pay $20 an hour for minimum wage, they're going to have less people. They're going to have more robots. Because a robot doesn't sue you. A robot doesn't cough on your food. I'm actually looking forward to it when they have it that way. I bet the food's going to taste better personally. Um, and so that's, you know, where, where, the, where the money's going. And, and also, obviously, these trends, though, are, are very powerful. There's nothing Joe Biden and Donald Trump can do about a 1970s laws that aborted all the kids in China. That is out of their control. <laughs> and there's nothing they can do about Social Security being put in the general fund the way it was a long time ago. There's nothing they can do about, um, you know, uh, a lot of these local laws passed in these areas. And so it's very funny because when we vote in November, people will say, well, I'm going to do all these things for you. But you all know that they're not that powerful. They can't control all these things. There's a lot of things that works. But, I mean, the good news is, I guess, whenever COVID hit, it showed everybody, well, what are we, what's the world going to look like? if we don't have China making our stuff. And so what do we start having? Shortages. And we know one thing about Americans are we can't have shortages, right? That's not possible. So right now, as we look at here in Manchester and you drive around town, I think where we're gonna be in five years, all these new factories, all these new houses being planned, that's a reaction to China going down because those jobs are not moving here. Now, everybody wanted those jobs here. Who wants to work there? <laughs> you know, and that's why if you look at the potholes, the number one reason why you're going to see more immigration is, well, these companies need people to fill those potholes at midnight. They need people to do those work at work. <laughs> and, and honestly, too, we need those people paying Social Security. <laughs> we need those people paying Medicare. <laughs> because it's a big Ponzi scheme, right? You take some, they took all your money, they gave it to the last generation. Now you're taking all the money of this generation, you're taking it. Then the hope is I'm going to take it from the next generation. It's just a, a pyramid scheme, not a Ponzi. So, but that's the whole thing there. Um, but that's kind of where we're looking. But all overall, when you look at the trend, th the most encouraging sign of the trend is that these companies are still making so much more money 
in all these events. They're adapt they've adapted to the new normal, right? If you look at banks, it might be bad for State Farm that they lost all that money on those 2% loans, but here's the flip side, right? If they can readjust their books and start charging 8% on their money, can, if, they can, if, if, if these banks can make it through the next four or five years without trouble, all their rates are going to be higher, which means their profit's going to be what? Higher too. They just got to get through this turn, you know? And unless you have a big event occur, they will, and you'll never think anything of it. <laughs> yeah. I read an article yeah. the other day about <clears throat> why hasn't the present administration um, canceled the tariffs off of the Trump administration for China? Because they grew. And it went in, and I just skimmed over, but maybe you, you, you know this, but it, it said something like Americans, based upon these tariffs on China, have saved 460 some odd billion dollars. Uh -huh. Spend a lot uh -huh. of money. How do we save money on tariffs? I thought it was the other way around. Okay, so what Trump did, of course, is he put a tariff on Chinese goods. And what they figured out in the data is when the tariff went on Chinese goods, people bought less Chinese products. <laughs> Shock. And so more of those products were made in America and, you know, pro American countries. And so what has occurred is they realized that those tariffs created a lot of jobs here. And because those tariffs created jobs here, the last thing Joe Biden wants to do is get rid of those, right? Because if there's one thing Republicans and Democrats agree on, I mean, Janet Yellen was in China yesterday. What did she tell them? You guys better not give any money to Russia because we'll shut you down. Who said that? Janet Yellen. Think about that, right? She's about this tall. Right? No, no, that was not her. That was actually um, Powell. What she did say something like that, but she did, if you actually, what I like about Janet Yellen is she did tell Joe Biden whenever he was going to do a stimulus, you need not spend so much money, it's going to cause inflation. And she's actually on the record saying that. So I like, I mean, she's got a lot of credibility to me. But what I love about it is she's like a little nice grandma. And she went over to the, the leaders of China who don't really, you see any women as leaders in China? There aren't any women over there leading that country. And she went over there and she told them, you guys give money to Russia, we will shut you down. She told the leader of China that, told everybody else that. Look, they import their food. They import their electricity. Now, I'll tell you one thing. If the world goes bad, I don't want a gold bar. I want a hot shower again. Okay? I, I can't imagine. I take three showers a day. drive Susie crazy. Can you imagine... Um, not having a hot shower for a month, I'm not sure what I would come up with. I would come up with some kind of contraption that would probably burn my skin off. I'm just telling you, I would, I, it would be terrible. <laughs> I know, but I'm just telling you. So yesterday, Janet Yellen went to China, and she was in China. And remember, she's, she's a female, and she told all those men, you will not do business with Russia. If you do, we will shut you down. So the one thing that both Republicans and Democrats agree on, 100% is what? China is not our friend. And remember, it's not as simple as just them being negative on Taiwan. They're literally running out of people. China has less use to us. See, in the past, we've benefited from all this cheap labor. All these people that would work 70 hours a week, they don't exist anymore. So not only is China threatening us, but they don't benefit our companies anymore. And since they don't benefit us, what are politicians doing? Throw them away. Not only that, they've got a whole lot less women than they have men. Sure. They avoid the women? Yes. And so that it's the worst female abortion ever. You're right. Here it is. It's terrible. They literally aborted most of the women. And now they don't have any women to marry. Yeah. And they have... <laughs> Their country will be smaller than the United States by the end of this century. And remember, when I was a kid growing up, eat all your food, they're starving kids in. And now people are like, oh no, they're starving kids in India. Or they're starving kids in Africa. There's, that whole concept is not in my kids' vocabulary because they've killed off their culture through abortion. By killing all those women. Contrary to popular belief, men can't have kids yet. And so... Um, that's what that's what's uh, what
what occurring. And so, yeah, probably sure I agree. But, but the, 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 the point is, um, when you're looking at this, though, the tariffs were effective. And, and one thing is funny is, you know, remember Donald Trump, when he put those tariffs in place, he got a lot of flack. But if you look at it now, you say, wait a minute, that was pretty forward thinking because the economy's flipping around. And now that China, and, and China may invade Taiwan because as you die off, as, you, as your country starts going down, a lot of times your people start trying to kill you. So if you're a leader, what do you do? You gotta blame somebody else. It's not, it's not my fault that we killed all those women. It's not my fault we're running out of people, even though it is, he's part of that regime that did that. Um, it's the United States. The United States hates us. So what's he gonna do? He's gonna blame somebody else. So he may invade Taiwan simply as a distraction. You know, um, there's that movie, war, war, you know, whenever um, a lot of people think when Bill Clinton bombed Yugoslavia, it was to escape the affairs. You know, there's a whole movie about it. It's a very big political thing. George W. Bush clearly invaded, or at least he may not have known, but Dick Cheney knew if they invaded Iraq, it would help them in the 2004 election. So it's very, very possible that um, that's what they'll do. But here's the thing. If they don't do it in the next five years, now, now I'm, I'm over time, but here's a funny one, just so you guys know. So last year, the president of China, Xi, he went, they've been building all these nuclear missile silos, right? So he went out there and he inspected them. And what he found was, because there's silos in the ground, the hatches didn't open. Okay? Another thing he found was that apparently jet fuel is also equivalent of whiskey or moonshine. And so the people have been drinking the jet fuel. And so he, the reason why he fired the leader of the missile program was, well, A, they were selling the jet fuel off as alcohol, and they were filling it full of water. So when they're parading the things through, they're like, oh, here's H2O. We got some water coming out of here, and there's no jet fuel. And, and, and then the other thing was the hatches didn't open. Because like, so if he had ordered them to nuke the United States, a lot of those missiles were going to, well, I mean, you know, I'm not sure you can ignite water very well. <laughs> and so it's, and, and, and so one of the things is, is he's, he's changed his opinion because he's like, I spent all this money buying Russian military equipment and then they tried to reproduce it. They, they stole all the patents from Russia. Then they realized they don't work very well. If you guys want to know, you know what country is using the biggest innovator for military is actually Iran. Iran took some of the American drones that had, one of them that had fallen in Iraq, they captured it and they've been remanufacturing it. They now have eight factories around the world remanufacturing our stolen drone technology for these suicide drones that are devastating the Middle East and they're devastating um, Ukraine right now. And it's not, so what's funny is the Russians who've been selling military weapons forever are actually buying military weapons from the Iranians because the Russian, uh, Russian prime uh, general has stolen himself half of all the money they spent on military equipment since he's been leader of Russia. And you know, and so the problem is they've stolen all the money, they've drank all the jet fuel. And so, so the only country that's actually making military equipment is the Iranians. And of course, um, if you go deeper into that conflict, um, there's a, they, I mean, they're, they're true believers in their, their faith, and so they're a little bit more extreme than the Russians and the, and the rest of them. But the point is, um, the, uh, it is funny. But uh, the reason, but it is, it, is, it is hilarious that what's happening in China is our little grandma treasury secretary is telling off the Chinese leaders yesterday publicly. And it's, and it's pretty, um, you know, uh, actually, you know, if you guys know the thing, everybody gives Joe Biden a hard time about not knowing what's going on. Well, he actually had to tell the president of China last year that their country didn't have electricity in a lot of part of the country. You know, a lot of the factories weren't running because they didn't have power. <laughs> and so, uh, anyway, um, that's what's going on. I mean, the good news is for the stock market side, and this is the biggest thing, is all this stuff's not as relevant, but what we're seeing here is you're seeing a renaissance of industrial development all around the world, and they're all countries that are allied or at least pro-U.S., right? 
if you know, and so, um, but India is probably our biggest country to watch because that is the number one. That will be one of the number one places probably for you all to invest money over the next 10 years. It won't be China, you know, but it's very likely to be India. And it's based on demographics. If you kill all your kids off, don't be surprised when you have no population. You know, I mean, it's pretty, pretty uh, dumb way to look at things. But thanks for coming in today. Thanks for tuning in on. Sorry, it took so long. I talked too much.